Well, um, <coughs> thank you everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and an honor to be with Rupert, whom I've read for over 20 years. It's very strange to be on stage with him now. Um, <coughs> I'm a research fellow and associate lecturer at Exeter University, where I'm doing research on philosophy and psychedelics. And uh, Rupert, of course, has a background in philosophy and researching psychedelics. And of course, Rupert is a well, and needs no introductions, a well-known biologist on the controversial side, let's say. Um, so Rupert and I have been in correspondence for a week or so uh, in, to uh, prepare for this event. And, and one of the, we exchanged a few texts. And uh, one of the texts I received from Rupert is his recent article, Is the Sun Conscious? And um, I'm, I'm very interested in this because I did my PhD on panpsychism, the view that minds are ubiquitous throughout nature. And um, so I, I was going to start by asking you um, if you might explain that article a little bit, why it seems preposterous to some people to think that the sun might be conscious and how that sort of philosophy might relate to psychedelic experience. Well, in traditional cultures, it's taken for granted that the sun is conscious. It's a god or a goddess. In Japan, it's a goddess. In Germanic, um, <clears throat> no, in, in Latin cultures, it's a god. In India, it's Surya. Um, so it's taken for granted that the sun, the stars, and the heavenly bodies are conscious beings. That's why we call the planets by the names of gods and goddesses. Um, but in, and, and in the Middle Ages, um, philosophers like St. Thomas Aquinas thought of the planets and the stars as conscious beings uh, with angelic intelligences. And Plato called the uh, planets the visible gods. Um, so the idea that the heavens are animate, that they're alive and conscious, is a very old idea and I would say pretty well universal. Um, what makes our own culture so eccentric is that in the 17th century, at the beginning of the scientific revolution, uh, the whole of the heavens and the earth were declared unconscious, inanimate, um, devoid of life. Um, everything was mechanical and machine-like. And so in that context, asking if the sun's conscious seems absurd. For a materialist, um, it's just a stupid question. It's something that, you know, primitive people might think, ignorant people might think, children might think because they draw the sun with a smiley face. Um, so they may think it's conscious, but grown up, mature, sensible, educated people ought not even to consider that question, dismiss it with the contempt it deserves. And that's the way it's been treated for several centuries. Um, <clears throat> well, I think in my own case, I'm predisposed towards panpsychism. In 1990, I wrote a book called The Rebirth of Nature about the reanimation of the world. I lived for seven years in India where the Gayatri Mantra is one of the most fundamental prayers in Hinduism, um, asking for the blessings of the sun to illuminate our meditation. Um, so what I was doing in this uh, article in the Journal of Consciousness Studies is trying to put this idea of the sun being conscious in the context of Western science and philosophy. And the move towards panpsychism in philosophy has been a big help. Galen Strawson helped to open the floodgates, and you're part of this movement too as a panpsychist philosopher. And what panpsychism does is liberates our imagination because it says that consciousness doesn't have to be located only in brains. Whereas the normal view, the neuroscience view, is that consciousness is generated by brains and therefore it's only in beings with brains like us. The bigger the brain, the more the consciousness. Um, whereas panpsychism, which considers whether even electrons and atoms could be conscious, opens the possibility of saying, well, is the sun conscious? Are the stars conscious? I think they probably are. And they uh, meet many of the criteria for consciousness that one could think of. They have agency, they seem to be self-organizing, they, they have complex electromagnetic patterns which could be the interface between their mind and, and, and their thoughts. So anyway, in, uh, what I want to do is explore this possibility uh, in the context of panpsychism. And you're, um, uh, I've, not only have you read my paper 
on the conscious son, but I've read your paper on the philosopher Spinoza, um, his pantheistic views, and slightly curiously and uniquely um, in relation to psychedelic experience with 5-methoxy dimethyl tryptamine. So perhaps I could ask you to say a little bit about that. Yes, well, I don't know who's the, uh, who's the weirder here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> no, when, when you put it that way. Um, so I, um, yeah, so I, I've done my uh, uh, PhD on, on, on uh, panpsychism, then with Galen Strawson, who was just speaking as the examiner. Um, and, um, but I always did it below the human level, well, human level and below, uh, going up to the stars is uh, known as cosmopsychism. It's a sort of polite term for pantheism, really, in analytic philosophy, at least. F okay, first of all, what is 5-MeO-DMT? 5-MeO-DMT is one of the most potent psychedelics known to mankind. Um, it, uh, I, um, for research reasons, I had to take some. <laughs> and um, and the, reas the reason was that uh, Spinozism, Spinozism is, let me explain Spinozism for, before 5-MeO-DMT. Spinozism then was the original pantheism. P pantheism was coined by Joseph Raphson, British uh, mathematician, after Spinoza's theory. Um, pantheism means that all is, all is God, nature is God. And um, so Spinoza's thought, in a nutshell, is um, contra Descartes, who split the world into mind and matter, extension and thought, um, Spinoza said that extension and thought, mind and matter, uh, matter and mind re respectively, were actually attributes of one substance, which he calls God or nature. In other words, what he does is he makes, he argues that as God is the perfect being, God also has extension. God also has space. So God is all of mind, but also all, all, all of space. And he argues that in a very rational, uh, he calls it a geometric method. And um, this this substance, this nature, this God, has what he calls an infinite intellect. Um, in other words, some kind of overmind, huge cosmic mind. It's, um, he, his, his views were suppressed. He was excommunicated by the Jewish community. He was, um, his books were banned by the Christian community. Um, for many reasons, people said he was an atheist. If you're saying that God is nature, then you're basically saying that God doesn't exist. Um, and he said in his book, you know, God does not love you. So it wasn't the most Christian charitable God. Um, but anyway, it interested me. Um, I th there's a parsimony to the philosophy. Now, in relation to psychedelics, in the mystical literature, there's a lot, as you know, on um, so-called unio mystica, or um, unitive events, where you believe, at the least, that you are becoming part of the cosmos. This very much sounds like, prima facie at least, um, Spinoza's infinite intellect. So I thought, but what is this experience? Doing the research, I realized then that 5-MeO-DMT was supposed to be the most unitive of all psychedelics. So I thought um, perhaps it would give me an experien experiential insight into um, this theoretic framework that Spinoza had. And so, and, and, uh, and uh, I, in my essay, I argue that, I argue how you can compare the two, phenomenologically with 5-MeO-DMT and uh, metaphysically with Spinozism. And that's my general interest, how theories of consciousness that go beyond the brain, um, how that has repercussions on psychedelic experience, because, um, you know, normally we think of psychedelic experience as hallucinatory. They're called hallucinogens. I mean, they can be called hallucinogens. Um, but of course, if we expand our theory of the mind and reality, then perhaps there's some veridicality, some truth to the experience we have. Or what say you? Well, I'm not quite sure where to begin, the psychedelics or Spinoza. Let's start with Spinoza. Um, <clears throat> I was very interested in your article because I always find Spinoza's philosophy confusing. And I find that this calling it God or nature sort of rather squelches the argument right from the beginning because you haven't got the option of looking at whether God and nature are distinguishable there because he defines them as the same. Right. But then um, his view of, of God having this, uh, there's a timeless or eternal quality uh, as well as the natural world. So actually he's saying God isn't just 
nature, which is all about change and process. There's another aspect to it. And he's also saying that within nature, there's um, a principle of striving, or every uh, living thing has kainatus, this striving, which is goal-directed behavior, at the very minimum, about preserving itself. Yes. Um, well, you see, what my own general overview is that the ultimate reality is not a monism, it's, it's a trinitarian. I mean, I'm against Cartesian dualism, not because I think two is too many, but I think it's too few. Um, I think we need three, not two, <laughs> as general principles. And in a, in a, the, there is a, a lot more in common between theological systems in different religions um, than there is that divides them. And there's a wonderful book, you may know it, by David Bentley Hart called The Experience of God, Being, Consciousness, Bliss. Um, where he shows that in, in the Hindu system, you, you have Sat, Chit, Ananda as a description of ultimate consciousness. Sat is the ground of all consciousness and being. Chit is the contents of consciousness, that which is known, what um, Indians call Nama Rupa, names and forms. And Ananda is bliss or joy, because ultimate consciousness is blissful or joyful. But it's also to do with change and movement which they call Shakti. The, the energetic principle in nature is feminine and called Shakti. Well, um, the Christian Holy Trinity seems to me uh, very similar. The God the Father is the ground of conscious being. I am that I am is God's first announcement of his nature, conscious being in the present. The Logos, the second person of the Trinity, is names and forms. It's that which is known. God the Father is the knower. The Logos is that which is known. Um, and that seemed to me like nature in Spinoza's system, whereas the God beyond the transcendent part was like... And then the Holy Spirit is the dynamical moving principle, energy, breath, flow, wind, change, uh, and that role is taken up by Conatus. So I thought, I think, when I read your article, I thought of Spinoza as being crypto-Trinitarian. <laughs> and... Um, and I, then I thought, well, what about this actual experience of unity of consciousness by 5-methoxy-DMT giving you this sense of a Spinozan unity? Well, I've never said this in public before, but in a foreign land, I did actually, for research purposes, explore this, <laughs> <laughs> explore this question myself. I was also in a foreign land, I should <laughs> point out. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, and curiously enough, um, this imageless 5-methoxy-DMT experience very different from more visual psychedelics, as you rightly pointed out. Um, for me, it was a Trinitarian experience. It was my closest experience to being part of the Holy Trinity. Um, well, so that's, okay. it wasn't a knockdown argument in favour of Spinozism, <laughs> or uh, I thought it was perhaps possibly an argument in favour of the crypto-Trinitarian inter interpretation. Well, but okay, interesting. I mean, this is the first time I've ever heard, the first interpretation I've heard of such kind. But that brings us onto this interesting discussion uh, that was had in the 1960s, and it's beginning to pick up again uh, between contextualism and perennialism. And uh, the argument, very basically, is there are certain thinkers, um, perennialists. The epitome of that's probably Aldous Huxley, uh, perhaps William James as well, who argue that um, amongst all religions and or all mystics amongst all religions and also amongst psychedelic experiences, there is one um, uh, there is one ultimate experience which transcends all culture and is the same. It's just the interpretation which differs. So I interpret it as Spinozism, you as Trinitarianism, someone else in another way perhaps. Um, but ultimately the experience is the same. And that's compared, contrasted to uh, contextualism, which is the argu argument that your culture and your life fully determine the experience. Um, so for example, in, um, in the West, we are prone to see Jesus and, um, and uh, the burning bush or whatever. Whereas in the, in the uh, Americas, you're more prone to see jaguars and snakes and whatever, right? So what's your take on this? And there are midpoints as well. Do you, think, uh, do you think psychedelic experiences are determined by one's culture or do you think there's something beyond that that they uh, point towards? 
Well, I think some aspects of them take us way beyond our own culture. I mean, when I first took LSD around 1971, um, the, I'd been educated in a completely mechanistic way. I was at the time, I'd been converted to atheism by my science teachers. I was in Cambridge, I was a don at Cambridge when I took it. And I was, you know, I'd been to physiology lectures, I knew about neurotransmitters in the brain and, um, and so on. And I took LSD and this was so off the map of anything I'd been taught or told about, except for reading Ald Aldous Huxley, um, that I didn't interpret it exactly in the context of the culture I knew because it was not on that map. Um, it's so, more on that map now. But, um, yeah. the, but there's, a, there's an aspect of, uh, which takes us beyond the realms of cultural names and forms and so on. And what do you think that experience, so that tends towards a per, uh, perennialist viewpoint. What um, do you think, I mean, how would you distinguish between hallucinations? Because obviously some forms of psychedelic experience, more visual ones, are hallucinatory. Um, and others are not. What, how, would you, how do you think one could go about uh, determining whether one's hallucinating or actually gaining access to some metaphysical realm beyond uh, what's offered through materialism? Well, let me come back to the contextualism thing because I actually have a take on that. This, it slightly depends on my own theory of morphic resonance and so I can't spend half an hour explaining it, but very briefly it's the idea there's a collective memory, there's a memory in nature, there's a resonance from similar systems in the past to the present. So if a lot of people in the Amazon take ayahuasca in shamanic cultures where it's all about jaguars and uh, with particular mythologies, serpents, jaguars and so on, then if Westerners come along and take ayahuasca, um, the same kinds of changes are going to happen in their brain, which may put them in resonance with those who've taken it before. And so there may be a culturally shaped collective memory of the ayahuasca experience, uh, which affects people who don't come from that culture at all. And when Claudio Naranjo, a psychotherapist, gave uh, uh, ayahuasca to middle-class people in Chile and Santiago, who'd never heard of Amazonian jaguar cults, they had visions of jaguars and things. So I don't think it's because there's molecules in the brain that respond to dimethyltryptamine and create jaguar images inside the head. I think it's because they were picking up on a kind of collective memory through morphic resonance of the culturally impregnated experience. Okay, so, so you have um, a take on both sides. I mean, one, one uh, aspect of the psychedelic experience which I find really mysterious, and I, I've got, I mean, there are different arguments made for it, but I don't think any are compelling, is the, um, the common vision of Lilliputians, little people, elves, goblins, fairies, and whatever. And um, we see that in the West, uh, you know, from over, before Terence McKenna and that lot, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century. We also see it, interestingly, in um, the Amerindian uh, cosmologies, which, are, which use psychedelics on a regular basis, which is part and parcel of their cosmology. Now, I'm not going to ask you for a, an interpretation of that, but that seems a common, a common uh, view which is hard to ascribe any veridicality to, any truth to. Well, what do you think? Well, it depends whether we think there is sort of autonomous entities in, in a kind of psychic sp uh, space or imaginal realm. Um, no, I got interested in this, I, you know, I'm an empiricist at heart, and I got interested in this question in relation to dreams, because psychedelic experiences, a, a few people have had them, most people haven't, but everyone's had dreams, and in our dreams we enter a realm where all sorts of improbable things happen. Dreams are hallucinatory, and they're not really happening, and we're asleep in bed. So I think of psychedelic experiences as sort of exaggerating the dream state, and we enter it from the waking state. And, but in dreams, we encounter all sorts of people. You know, I meet people in my dreams, I talk to them. And so then the question is, what happens if, if lots of people have a cultural image? Um, does that get into their dreams? So I thought, well, what about Ganesh in India? Ganesh, the elephant-headed god, couldn't possibly have existed in the normal sense of the word. 
uh, you know, unless there were elephant head transplants and stuff. It's very implausible. Um, so Ganesh is a cultural image. He's on calendars. He's you know in, in statues, in temples, and in people's houses. We have a Ganesh in our own home in Hampstead. Um, so he removes obstacles. He's very, almost all Indians, or certainly Hindus, see Ganesh images all their lives. So then I asked the question, does Ganesh, uh, Ganesh appear in dreams? So I went online and I found that there were actually, in India, in English, Ganesh dream discussion groups. <laughs> um, all these Indians discussing their Ganesh dreams. Ganesh appears in dreams and he has particular qualities. And he's obviously more than a personal hallucination because he's a collective uh, phenomenon. He's part of the collective imagination. And if he appears in dreams, he's meant to be a channel of the energy of the god Shiva. Maybe in dreams he really does have that role. Maybe he's a kind of manifestation of a deeper um, principle that works through this image in people's dreams, then it wouldn't just be a kind of fancy hallucination right. in a particular person's mind. Some, some kind of Jungian archetype then that's manifesting through psychedelics. Let yes. me move the, um, the discussion on from um, religion and metaphysics, say, to um, the modern day. So we're currently going through the so-called psychedelic renaissance, uh, so-called why do you think psychedelics are becoming popular now in many fields um, once more? What, what, what do you ascribe to this renaissance? I think because they're opening up people's uh, minds to this much larger realm of the mind for exactly the same reasons that I find them so liberating. And I think for many people they're a kind of rite of passage out of a shrunken materialist worldview. Um, into a wider view of consciousness. So what do you make of um, current attempts to medicalize them, to turn them into medicines uh, which can be patented and so on? Do you see this as in harmony with that uh, metaphysical outlook or, or somehow in competition? Well, I mean, people may try to turn them into medicines that are medicalized and patented, but the actual psychedelics aren't going to go away. I mean, magic mushrooms are going to go on growing in pastures in Wales and elsewhere. Um, and people are still going to be able to pick them and take them for free. So I don't think, I mean, that's a possible, it's happening, but it's part of the modern world. But I think that the, what's interesting about it is that the curative effect of psychedelics for people with chronic depression and also... Um, you know, for various addictions. The curative effect is not just the molecule affecting molecules in brains, it's the experience itself of this greater connection and unity uh, which is curative. It gives people a greater sense of meaning, connection, and that their mind's part of something greater. And that has a curative effect. Well, this is the interesting thing about the, um, the medical aspect of the psychedelic renaissance, but that something that my uh, colleague, Professor Christine Hauskeller, writes about. Um, that it seems that medicine at the moment is um, instilling madness to cure madness, as it were. And that these um, experiences that can be had on psychedelics do not fit into the sort of scientific materialist framework at all, but nonetheless they can be utilized against depression, PTSD, and so on and so forth. Of course, they're currently looking at ways in which to uh, use these chemicals without inducing the experience for the same effects. But it's, you know, I think, as you say, the, you know, the, it is the phenomenology itself that is curative. And well, if they do the research, they'd actually find out, wouldn't they? And I suspect, like you, I predict that they'd find that without the experience, it would have very little effect. I should think so, because I think for most, most be I mean, you know, through the ages, there have been mystics who have had these somewhat similar experiences. Now, there's a debate whether, um, you know, mystics the experience of mystics in Christianity, for example, is akin to certain experiences on psychedelics. I think my own view is that um, there are many types of mystical experiences, many types of psychedelic experience. There is an overlap, though, at one point. And um, it seems that many people who have had such experience, experiences, um, for them, this is a life-changing moment. So it would, it would be very interesting if um, chemical alone without the visualization or without the experience could induce such an effect. Another interesting thing I think from, from the perspective of the philosophy of mind is 
um, if the experience itself has an effect upon your health and mental well-being and so on, that's an example of mental causation, of course, you know, that the you know, experience ha yeah. has the effect. Now, um, although most people, I would imagine, believe in mental causation, in other words, you know, if I have a desire, it will move me to the pub or something like this for a beer, um, of course, it cannot be explained. It, mental causation is very problematic for our general understandings of um, the mind and its relationship to the brain. Well, from a materialist point of view, it's very problematic. Um, but I think that actually within medicine, uh, the placebo effect is also an example of medical... Uh, you don't need to go as far as psychedelics. I mean, the placebo effect is mental causation. People's beliefs and expectations affect how a drug or a cure works, and it often a blank pill will do as well as an actual antidepressant or something. So right, that's surely it? very strong evidence for mental causation that's actually arisen within the context of mechanistic medical research. Yes. Um, right, I've got some questions here. Uh, further questions. What new cultural possibilities do you think are on the horizon with this intake of psychedelics? I mean, how do you see the, tw you know, the f 20, years to 20 years in the future, how do you think um, this is the current psychedelic renaissance might affect it? Well, it could be chaotic, of course, but I, I think it could be um, this therapeutic model that's developing people running psychedelic retreats, um, like the British Psychedelic Society. You can go and do a legal mushroom trip in a weekend in a nice country place in Holland. Mm -hmm. They'll be doing this in Oregon soon. In the United States, people go to Peru for ayahuasca experiences. This is one model that's um, actually already with us and I think is quite a good model. It means people take them with guidance and with someone who can help them interpret and integrate that experience. Um, I myself think the most interesting development here is, is psychedelic religions, um, where the psychedelic experience is integrated with a, a mythic and religious framework. So it's not just an individual trip, but integrated into a sort of wider community. And I'm thinking, for example, of the Santo Daime Church in Brazil, where you have the psychedelic experience of ayahuasca as a kind of communion uh, as part of their religion. Well, it seems that the latest science um, shows that psychedelics are not as dangerous as uh, was propagated in the sort of mid to late 20th century. And uh, if people accept that, of course, then I should see that such retreats will become popular. My own view is that I think there are two reasons, two main reasons for the psychedelic renaissance. I think, first of all, um, it is medicalization and the money, to be cynical, it is the money in that. I mean, you know, the market for depression is in the billions and, of course, SSRIs are not patentable anymore. Um, so with psychedelics as um, cures for depression, say, um, there is a lot of investment in it. And now there are more conferences on psychedelic investment than on psychedelic experience, it seems. However, I think there's another, another interesting aspect which you alluded to as well, um, which is Schopenhauer, who was an atheist, he said there's a metaphysical need in all of us. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be any established religion, but there's some desire in our psyche to somehow go beyond um, the material conditions we perceive. And I think psychedelics allow for that, at least, you know, whether or not they are veridical is um, irrelevant to the fact that they make people at least believe it. And that gives, I think that gives an extra dimension, extra richness to life. You know, I see it as, you know, um, someone said they don't need psychedelics to me because they've, they've got a good life. I mean, I see that as saying you don't need music. You know, you've got a good life, so what, what good is music? I mean, you know, it's the same with psychedelics. They, they're enrichers. And I think they open my, your mind to um, other realities. But there's so much more. Um, the after party for this session is going to be really interesting. So do join <laughs> us for that. Right. Okay, but anyway, thank you, Rupert. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.